Hi everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm author of The Snowball System and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 high-end professionals all over the world on sound, efficient, authentic business development techniques. Really cool stuff, it's my life's passion. And our show is all about bringing guests, bringing amazing thought leaders onto the show to ask them how we can get better at business development. And it's so fun to mash up their ideas with ours. And this, in this episode, I bring you Jay Bear. Jay is amazing. He's one of the top marketing minds on the planet. I've read several of his books. I visit his blog often to find the best ideas around marketing. And it was super cool today to pair his marketing ideas with our business development ideas in a way that was really, really meaningful. So if you are interested in getting better at marketing or better at business development, this is the episode for you. So before we get into it, know that if you want our best ideas on how to take your business development game to the next level, we write a weekly newsletter. It's incredibly powerful. You can re usually read it in five or six minutes and it's gonna deliver a nugget, one idea to you every single week on how you can take your business development game to the next level. All you need to do to get it is head over to growbigplaybook.com. That's growbigplaybook.com. Takes about 10 or 20 seconds to sign up and you're all set for life. All right, here we go. Here is Jay Bear and you are gonna love what he has to say. Hey everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm with Jay Bear, and Jay is one of the most preeminent brains about marketing. His book, Utility, I thought was absolutely fantastic. You should run out and get it right now. But he's going to give us the live version of not only what's in Utility, but Hug Your Haters and all of his other content online. And his website over at Convince and Convert is one of the best resources I've ever found when it comes to marketing. So Jay, first question, we can dive right in. Our, our audience is really interested to know your big idea about how they can do a better job at getting great at business development. Go. Thanks so much, Mo. Great to be here. I, I tell you this, the, the challenge with business development, especially now, is the technology has made it so easy to, to create contacts, right? Whether it's marketing automation systems, whether now you've got uh, you know, easy to use video messaging systems, text messaging systems. It, it used to be that you could have an advantage just by bringing a better, uh, a better tool set, right? Bringing a, a gun to a knife fight. Uh, but now everybody's got guns. And, and what's happening, and you're seeing this on LinkedIn and other places in your inbox, is the volume of business development messaging is out of control. Like, I don't know about you, Mo, but but the number of people who are in my inbox of, of all different places, whether it's LinkedIn inbox or Twitter, Instagram, email, text messaging saying, buy stuff for me, it is ridiculous, right? It is, it is like it, hacking my way through a jungle. Uh, so here's the best way you can do it. Turn your customers and clients into your best sales and marketing advantage. I love your little quips like help, not hype, things like that. Yeah. So, so here's the, so how here's do the thing. Um, competency doesn't create conversation. And the best way to grow any business, any business, is for your customers to do the growing for you. One of my favorite sayings is from Robert Stevens, who's the founder of Geek Squad. He once said that advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Now, there is a lot of truth to that. There is certainly a time and a place for advertising, but it is also true, Mo, that in many cases, the most successful brands actually advertise the least. How is that possible? Well, it's because their customers proactively spread the word for them. But the way you can do that, the way you can turn your customers and clients into a significant word of mouth engine for your business, and especially in complex uh, health, financial services, big ticket uh, items like we're talking about here, it's not like you're buying licorice at Kroger, right? Like there's a lot of people uh, in the buying committee and you're going to check with current clients. Like word of mouth has a much bigger impact on sales than we give it credit for. How, how, how much do we let word of mouth slide? Check this out, Mo. Even though word of mouth is the number one way that everybody generates business, fewer than 1% of companies have an actual word of mouth strategy. Isn't that appalling? 
And you've yeah. got a strategy for everything, right? You got a sales strategy, HR strategy, crisis management strategy, social media strategy, environmental services strategy, diversity. You got a strat. You got a desk full of strategies. But the one thing you don't have a strategy for is perhaps the most important thing of all, which is why would your customers tell a story about your business? Because as I said, competency doesn't create conversation. Nobody ever says, "Check this out." Let me tell you a story about this experience I just had. It was perfectly adequate. That's why you never see three-star reviews. What are you going to do? Let me tell you about this restaurant I went to. It was all right. Like no, nobody talks about that, right? So if you want your customers to, to proactively be a word of mouth engine, and you do, you've got to give them a story to tell, which means you have to do something different in your organization, something that they notice and talk about. And it could be organizationally or it could be even something that you do in business development per se. I'll give an example. So in a lot of cases in, in business development, there is a proposal. Yeah, you write down what you're going to do and for how much you're going to do it. Well, how do proposals get delivered now? What do clients expect? Well, they expect that you're going to create some sort of document. You're probably going to save it as a PDF and you're going to attach it to an email and you're going to send it, right? That's generally speaking how it works. Well, Mo, what if instead you decided to make the proposal itself something that clients would talk about, which turns them into volunteer marketers, which gets you potentially new clients for free? What if you took your proposal and you printed out the cover and all the other pages and you took it to a local bakery or grocery store and you said, I want you to make me a sheet cake and I want the icing on that sheet cake to look like the cover of this proposal. And then I'm going to take the proposal itself and I'm going to put it in a plastic envelope. And I'm going to put that plastic envelope underneath the actual cake once it's been baked. And then I'm going to have the cake delivered to my client, prospective client, so that in order to actually access my proposal, they have to eat an entire sheet cake. Would they remember that? Yes. Would they talk about that? Yes. Does that give you then an innate business development advantage? Yes. Jay, I think it's fascinating. And I think um, it reminds me of different times, like where a lot of our audiences, lawyers, consultants, different professionals, people like that, account managers at big healthcare companies. Yep. And they're reluctant to do things that make them, that feel risky at the yep. moment. And I think to build on what you said, doing the norm is actually the riskier thing sometimes Nailed it. than doing Nailed something it. that's a little bit different. So just, just so because you're in B two B, a professional services, doesn't mean that you took a vow of boredom. <laughs> I love it. It doesn't mean that, but that's how we all operate. Like, well, we couldn't possibly do anything interesting because it's too frivolous. Here's right. an example: There's an accounting firm in Indianapolis called Bognadoff and Dodges. They are, and no offense intended, unremarkable in almost every way. They <laughs> they do business returns, they do some personal returns, they do some tax and tax advice. They are indistinguishable in, in word and in deed uh, and in pricing and services from thousands and thousands and thousands of other accounting firms in this country. They do the exact same thing for the same money. Why would you hire them? Well, they have a talk trigger. And that's what we call these operational choices that you make that are intended to create conversations. It's a talk trigger. The talk trigger at Bogdanoff and Dodges is that they respond to every client every time, phone or email within five minutes. They have built a five-minute response time scheme inside the accounting firm. Now, I have had, I think, six accounting firms in my long professional career. Um, all of them, I think, fine. But I've never said, Mo, let me tell you, I got my tax return back. You won't believe it. All the numbers added up. Because that's what we expect accountants to do, right? Like that's, right. that's just like, that's competency, right? That's par for the course. Right. But if Bogdanoff and Dodges were my accounting firm, and perhaps they should be, uh, and they responded to me within five minutes every time, would I tell other people a story about that? I would. How do I know that to be true? They have more than 70 Google reviews for an accounting firm. And 90% of those reviews, and I know this because I analyzed it personally, mention their response time. They have turned a prosaic, how do you call clients back into a word of mouth advantage. And every single person tuning in can do something like that, Mo. Everybody can have a talk trigger. We just refuse to do it. Either A, we're afraid to stand out, 
or B, we just feel like people will talk about us even though we've given them nothing to talk about. So Jay, let's let's ask one last big question before I'll, I'll ask you how people can get more Jay. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I, I know where our audience is thinking right now. They're thinking, I sort of want to try this, but yeah. I'm afraid. So so to get them over that hump, yeah. what's your three minute answer to get them over that hump and just try to be a little bit different than normal? Yeah. So here's what you do. Uh, you don't just like sit around with a six pack of beer and come up with something and then like lean into it because that is scary. It'd be scary for me even. So I wrote a whole book about this. It's called Talk Triggers. Uh, you can find it in all the places and ways that books can be procured. You can also go to talktriggers.com, which has tons of free resources, uh, research, discussion guides, videos, infographics that, that will help you along your journey. But in the book, we talk about the process for actually creating talk triggers and rolling them out. And what you want to do, Mo, is pilot it. So you want to say, all right, um, based on the kind of process that I unfurl in the book, we don't have time to go through all the ways to come up with it. But um, it's not just like, here's a fun idea. That, that's a bad plan. But once you kind of do the work and figure out some talk triggers that might uh, be effective for your business, you pilot it. You say, we're going to roll this out to every nth customer or only new customers or only customers of this product or only customers in this geographical location. And then you monitor the talkability of that group, right? So do they spit it back to you? Do they mention it to customer service? Do you see reviews, et cetera? Um, and once you hit a specific talkability threshold, then you know there's a there there, and then you roll it out across the organization. Yeah, I love it. One, one of our mantras is think big, start small, scale up. And it's the same idea. We're going to change the whole exactly. culture, but we're not going to do it all at once. We're going to do a little pilot, test it, and then roll it out in concentric rings after that. So I love the idea. Well, cool. Well, Jay, I, you already answered my last question, I think, but but let's put a fine point on it. Where should people go to get more about Talk Triggers? I think it was talktriggers.com. Talktriggers.com is a great place to get info on uh, the word of mouth premise. The book itself is available, um, audiobook read by myself and my co-author, Kindle, hardcover, et cetera. And then as you mentioned earlier, convinceandconvert.com is our main site. We have thousands of, of articles and uh, podcasts and pieces of advice um, for, for folks who want to get better at business development and marketing. Yeah. And I, I can't recommend enough audience. I'm looking at you. Convinceandconvert.com is chock full. Probably the best resource I've ever found on marketing techniques for things like this. And of course, talktriggers.com, definitely worth going to. So Jay, thanks. Hey, audience, check this out. So if you like today's episode, you're going to love tomorrow's, or if you're watching these in sequence, the next one, because I'm going to ask Jay, how do we create and close more opportunities using amazing marketing? Check out. That's coming next. Thank you, Jay. You bet. Hey, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell. You know me. I'm your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm with Jay Bear, who's one of the best resources I've ever run across around marketing and doing things the right way and generating business without you having to go crazy doing it, doing it in a fun way too, which I love about Jay. So Jay, big question today, how does our audience create and close more opportunities? I think there's a couple things in terms of creating opportunities, Mo, that I would tell you. First, you have to focus on the problems you solve, not the services you offer. This is such a problem, especially in, in professional services and, and healthcare and legal and finance. Everybody says, well, we do this and we do this and we do this other thing. And it's like a checklist of services. And, and you do that because you think, well, that's actually what people want. No, they don't. They don't want services. They want a fix to a problem that they have. Let me put it to you this way, Mo. Nobody in the history of the world has needed socks. Everybody in the history of the world has needed their feet to be warmer. Smart people say we help warm feet. Not good people at business development say we sell socks. See the difference? It's a really important difference. And, and I'll tell you how we've done this in my own organization. So at convinceaconvert.com, there's actually in the top navigation of our site, a main link that says 17 problems. And you click on that and you get a long web page that literally is called 17 Problems We Solve. And it is exactly that. It is the 17 problems that my strategy team and myself solve for corporate clients. Like, 
w- you know, you can find deep in the website, like here, we also do content marketing strategy and we do social media strategy and we do customer experience strategy and we do word of mouth strategy. But the way we encapsulate it and when we talk about it is through the prism of problems, not the prism of services. So that's my first tip. Second tip is to really understand who you are selling to. And that sounds very obvious, but it gets harder and harder as time goes on because all the research suggests you've got broader and more complex buying committees in almost every industry. So you might, you know, you sold to two people in the past, now you're selling to nine people in the same organization, and you have to really understand what they care about. One of the things that everybody cares about is how they stack up to the competition. One of the things that's been very successful for my organization is creating content marketing assets on a regular basis that create opportunities for our sales team by tapping into this competitive thirst. Here's how we do it. We do a lot of work in higher education. We do a lot of work in travel and tourism, et cetera. So uh, last fall, we did a bunch of research and we published a report called Ranking the best websites among America's 50 largest universities. That's our audience, America's 50 largest universities. And we did a bunch of research. We built our own algorithm to determine what the best websites were. And then we promoted it to all of those universities and 41 out of the 50 downloaded it. And now seven of them are clients, right? Just figure out how you can rank your potential clients against one another, create an asset about that, and they will beat a path to your website uh, to download it. Now you've got the opportunity to interact with them with a nurture sequence, eventually a phone call, a proposal, uh, and and a client. And, and to me, that is all about understanding that, especially in the type of businesses that, that our viewers uh, are in, you're not going to close somebody in an afternoon, right? It, it's going to be months. We've got lots of clients we've been working on for years before they finally uh, sign. So you've got to build this kind of trusted leader informational relationship. And that's why it really is about providing value more so than selling anything. If you provide enough value, they'll sell themselves. You don't have to sell them. You just have to say, look, here's a bunch of cool stuff. And eventually they'll decide that you're the ones they want to give money to. I love it, Jay. And what I think is neat about this interview is a lot of times we have all kinds of different folks on the show, but they're not professionals themselves. And you're a professional yourself because you're not just an author speaker and an amazing one, but you've got this Convince and Fert company in which you're a professional. You provide services on your own. So I think it's neat talking about it through the lens of what you actually do. Now, with that said, a lot of our like consultants and, and accountants and and, and clients, they've got great assets. They've done this survey. They, they can rank this or that and all kinds of different things, right? But one of the things you talk about, and by the way, I love it. They need to do more of it. They need to do it in the way you just mentioned. So I'm not, I just want to put a fine bow on your example. It's fantastic. And I can see why people want to beat down your door. But I want to go deeper on this. One of the things you talk about often is how to market your marketing. How do you market your marketing? So why don't we play this out in this actual story? So you've got this amazing asset. You were in the midst of creating it with the top 50 university websites. I'll bet you were thinking about marketing the marketing when you were actually building the assessment, the algorithm, and all that. Let us before, decide before that. If it's in convert. Yeah. How'd you yeah. do it? How'd you do it? How'd you get how'd you build awareness? So what you want to do is figure out the marketing plan for the asset before you make the asset. Yes, keep going. Because it will it will help you build a better asset that way, right? If, if you know how you're going to put it in front of people, you'll start thinking about that from the beginning. And and the the best way, um, there's a lot of kind of technical things that we could talk about, but 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 philosophically, what we always tell people is you have to atomize your content. So the, and we do a lot of consulting around this this point for large B two B companies, primarily Oracle and Cisco and people like that. But but the challenge is they have an asset, and they think that the asset, the report, if you will, the survey, the white paper, that that is the actual thing. That's not the thing, right? That that's not the engine. That's the caboose, baby. You've got to atomize that thought leadership into a bunch of small bite sized chunks, right? So every time we do a report, we create two infographics, um, six summary videos, probably 15 to 20 different social media graphics, um, three blog posts, three emails, right? It's it's dozens of small assets because 
the problem, especially now when everybody is besieged with opportunities and information for you to say, hey, uh, guess what? You probably don't even know me, or if you do, you know me a little bit. Uh, what I'd like you to do is a first step in our relationship, if that's cool, uh, I would love for you to read an 18 page white paper, right? And your prospect is like, bro, how about dinner and a movie? Like, how about how about a courtship period? Um, because you're asking for a lot of my time and attention from the jump. So yeah. we um, we actually do a, a thing that we call VIA, Video Insights and Amplification, where every time we do a report that we create, or even um, when we're paid to amplify reports on behalf of partners, I, Jay, will read the report in um, early phase, and then I'll create three three-minute videos that summarize key parts of that report. And then we use those summary videos on the landing page, in LinkedIn, um, in, in emails to say, hey, um, you're aware of this report, and now you might be thinking, maybe I don't want to spend you know 20 minutes reading this. Let me tell you a couple of key points in this report just to kind of whet your appetite. Did you know? Boom, boom, boom. And then the whole idea is to increase conversion rate by merchandising the findings of the report in these short videos. So it's just little things like that, right? There is no there is no magic beans. There is no home run. There is no report you can create that will be so insightful that by itself, it will just take off. It doesn't work like that, right? It's it's the little things that surround the report. That's what actually drives people to the landing page, gets them to download it, et cetera. Jay, I oh, love the other thing is do a we- The other thing is a webinar. So every time you do a report, you want to have a couple of different webinars as well yes. um, that, that get people in one place uh, and, and merchandise report. I forgot to mention that, sorry. No, no, it's, it's killer. And a lot of our clients, love, they'll think, um, say I'm a lawyer at a big high-end law firm. I'm going to do some big webinar about the new regs that are coming down. You know, something really meaty and valuable that they know a lot about. And a lot of times they'll view the webinar as the finish line. Well, no, no, no. That, that's the starting line. That's what got you. That's what got somebody with eyeballs on you. How do you get, how do you get people in it? How do you follow up afterwards and all those kinds of Every things? single slide of your webinar is potentially a social media graphic. Perfect. Every single point, let's say you have five key points in the webinar. Every single one of those points is a blog post. Every single one of those points is potentially an infographic. Every single one of those points is potentially a video, right? So, so it's not about how do we promote the report. It's, it's how do we stitch together 25 assets that lead to the report. That's how you do it. I love it. And I loved your idea of you got to figure that out ahead of time. You don't, that's not something you try to put together at the end. So Jay, let's finish up this episode with this because I'm not sure what you'll recommend, but I, I, I know our audience is going to want it. Where's their best place to go to get more of your ideas on that exact, on our content from today? Yeah. So if you go to convinceconvert.com, which is our award-winning uh, blog and website, we've got lots of different strategies around how to atomize content, merchandise content, et cetera. Especially if you go to the content marketing section of uh, our resources, you'll find a whole bunch of, we've got a lot of downloads and templates and tips and calendars, all kinds of little stuff you can use. Well, I was just there today and I noticed something about webinars, you know, how to have a high end mm-hmm. webinar, how to get the most people on it, things like that. So yep. it's searchable, uh, folks, check it out because if you like what, what Jay talked about today, there is so much content out there on, on the blogs on convincingcurt.com. Jay, thanks, thanks for joining the show and folks check out this on the next episode. I'm going to ask Jay, how do we use all of his great content, all the stuff in his big brain to deepen relationships? So look forward to that. Thanks, Jay. See you later. Hey, everybody. It's Mo. You know me, your host here at Real Relationships and Real Revenue, joined by Jay Bear. Hey, if you didn't catch the last two episodes, Jay's sage advice about how do we get better at business development, how do we create and close more deals, all that stuff's in the last two episodes. And man, it was meaty. It packs a punch. In this one, Jay... I'm asking you a, a, a question that I think is interesting, so I'm not sure where you're going to go with it. And it is, how do we use, or what, I'll actually go broader. What's your best advice on how we can deepen relationships? Well, I think, first of all, understanding that the more transactional you think about the relationship, the more transactional that relationship's going to feel. So I think philosophically, it's, it's about um, valuing the relationship as a relationship more than you value what you're going to yield from that relationship. 
See, a lot of people have relationships because they believe it's going to create some sort of business development victory for them. They have relationships because they believe they're going to get paid. If that's your philosophy, ultimately, you're not going to have deep and rich relationships because people see that coming. You might be really good at hiding it, right? But but eventually, they understand that you're here because there's money at stake. The same way that dogs can smell fear, potential clients can smell desperation. So the best way to go about this, Mo, quite literally, is to build relationships that you want to have because you want to have a relationship. And if it ends up that somebody gets paid, great. But if not, that's okay too. That's the first piece. The second piece is to be there before the sale. My friend Chris Brogan uh, and his uh, co-author Julian Smith wrote a book called Trust Agents. Um, The second edition of Trust Agents came out last year. It's terrific. I really recommend it. And one of their key tenets is is to be there before the sale. The idea is that you say, all right, if we want to try and sell something to somebody at some point in the future, build those relationships now, even if you don't have anything to sell or you're not the right answer today, maybe someday you will be. And this idea that, hey, let me build a relationship, build a relationship with you. And seven days later, uh, I'm, I'm asking you if I can send you an invoice. That's not actually a relationship. See, you might think it is, but it's not actually a relationship. And so their idea is, is that you truly build a relationship. You, you follow people on social media and you comment on their posts because you're a human being and you have conversations with them that aren't about business. And then eventually... Uh, maybe there will be a commercial relationship. And that's the key word, Mo, that nobody actually embraces. The key word in all of this is eventually. The reason most people suck at business development is that they're not patient. And in some cases, it's not their choice. I understand that. But ultimately, it's because they're not playing the long game. They're playing the short game and trying to convince themselves it's the long game, but it's really not. So if you're trying to figure out what relationships to build today, It should be the relationships that you might try to monetize in 2022. What's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. What's the second best time to plant a tree? Today. Uh, And relationships work the exact same way. And of course, I wrote a whole book about this called Utility, which is about the fact that marketing is about help, not hype. If you really want to build deeper, more valuable relationships that yield victories eventually, then it is your responsibility to add all the value to the relationship, right? People always think of it as a quid pro quo, like, well, I'll give them something if they give me something. No, 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 man, that's totally wrong. You give them something every time. And if they choose to give something back, that's a gravy. That's their philosophy. Yeah, I totally agree. So a quick story, and I'll I'll get back to you. We were working with a a high-end management consulting one time, and the person goes, man, I just had a major unlock moment. I was thinking that going back and forth with prospects was like tennis. Like I lob something to them and I can't lob anything back till they respond. We're going, no, no, no. You're just like, you're practicing your serve. You just keep being helpful. So that was a huge deal for him. But a lot of folks haven't gone through our full sessions. So I think our audience is worried about this. I hear it all the time, Jay, and I want to get your feedback on it. A lot of times in this high-end professional space we work in, you know our audience, they can be reluctant to get personal. They can say, well, I'm only allowed to be commercial. I'm only allowed to talk about the law. I'm only allowed to talk about our healthcare services or whatever. So what's your best advice to get people over that hump, treat people as human beings, and have a professional but also a personal relationship? We have a lot of those clients too, and I would say usually that's used as an excuse, not um, as an actual problem. There's a lot of folks out there that say, well, the corporate policy is we can't be personal. Well, if you actually read the policy, that's not what it says. That's how you've interpreted it. Um, because you don't want to get personal, right? So your your lack of comfort does not equal policy. That's the first thing I'll say. Um, second thing is who you are is infinitely, listen to me, what I'm going to say right now, who you are is infinitely more interesting than what you do. Unless you're like an astronaut. That's like literally like the only list or maybe like, that's maybe the only one. Um, so if you are, a management consultant, nifty. You know how many management consultants there are out there? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. That is not interesting. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how cutting edge your practice is. Don't care. You've already bored me. But if you are a management consultant that happens to win uh, prizes for their roses, 
Now I'm interested. And now I'm going to remember that. I don't even like roses. I had them before. I tore them up because they're a pain in the ass to grow. But I will remember that you're the rose guy because our actual lives are interesting. Our work lives are boring. So if you can't find a way to insert a little personality into your interactions with people, you got to work on that, right? And and it's not about like, hey, you know, let's go out and, you know, do body shots at the disco. Like there's a happy medium there, guys. Like, you know, it's okay to treat people like people. Not only is it okay, trust me when I tell you, it will work a lot better. Uh, well, I'm cracking up because uh, I was an actuary in a former life at a consulting firm. So I can, I just thought of body shops in a, in a disco with actuaries. Yeah, like the whole thing perfect. Was One of the reasons people are bad at this is that they don't take the time to actually learn who the person they're trying to have a relationship with, what they are about, right? So I, how can I add value that's not based on work if I don't know who you actually are? If I don't know what your hobbies are, your passions, your family, what you do, right? So, you know, you got to learn whether it's, you know, by having conversations or social media stalking or some combination, you have to learn what that person cares about outside of business for you to provide value outside of business. And so a lot of times people say that they're not comfortable being personal, but it's because they haven't done the work to know what actually would be interesting in that realm. I totally agree. And for our audience, you know, the people we're, all, we're both talking to, it is really hard to tell if some management consultant, back to that example, is 20 or 30% smarter or better, but it is really easy to tell if they care more. It's really easy to tell if they're interesting. And 100%. Like and the bar is so low. You don't have to be that interesting. You just have to be more interesting than the other people who are probably avoiding this conversation. So, Like they say, right? If you get, if you get uh, attacked by a bear, you don't have to be the fastest runner, just faster than one other person in your group. <laughs> That's right. So you just have to be a more interesting than the average accountant or whatever. Right, like, right. I like your chances. If you're watching the show, I like your chances. Yeah, I like it. That's right. All right, folks. Um, they're gonna. Our, our audience is going to want to know, Jay, where should they get more on this topic, this particular yeah. topic? But I think what you cover in utility. Yeah, you bet. Uh, the book on this topic is called Utility, Y-O-U, uh, Utility, New York Times uh, bestseller. It's the utility principle of focusing on help, not hype, is part of the, the marketing structure of tons of enterprise organizations all over the world. Um, it's got a whole thing associated with it. So um, if you pick up the book, that'd be a great place. And then at convinceandconvert.com, which is our main site, there's lots and lots of resources um, about utility there as well. Well, I love it. And as uh, you know, we talked about in a prior episode, it's helpful to have other people rave about your work. So Jay, I'll rave, rave about your work. <laughs> One of the things I loved about utility was the idea of frame of mind awareness, mm -hmm. um, how you talk about building trust, a uh, friend of mind awareness, yeah. really applicable to our audience. So audience, I want to get real specific here because I like utility and I think you will too. So Jay, thanks for being on the show. Folks, in our next episode, this is super cool. We're going to ask Jay his best advice on how do we hack our habits to do the kind of stuff we're doing right now when we're ridiculously busy with client work, but we know these kind of things are going to align with our long-term success. So check that out. That's coming up next. Jay, thanks for being on the show. You bet. Thanks, Mo. Hey, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell. I have had a blast interviewing Jay Bear on our last three episodes. If you didn't catch them, go back and make sure that you do. We talked about how to be great at business development. We talked about how to use Jay's principles in his big brain about how to create and close more opportunities. We talked about how to deepen relationships, all the stuff that are that's on your mind. In this episode, we're going to talk about habits. And Jay, I love it how you talk about making marketing a process, not some one-time project and things like that. So in general, totally open-ended open, open -ended question, what's your best advice on how we can hack our own habits and be working efficiently at business development, even when we're yanked away by all the other demands that we've got. I mean, first of all, Mo, you have to enjoy it at some level in order to put real time into it. One of the things I, I, I talk about a lot, especially with regards to social selling and, and business development through social media, is that if you hate social media, you will suck at social media. Like it's it's kind of hard. I mean, if, if every time you've got to post something, you're doing it at bayonet point, you're like you're not going to be super good at it, right? So yeah. you've got to find the relationship um, nurturing schema 
that you actually enjoy. And I understand in some cases that's difficult because corporate says we can only use LinkedIn or whatever. But even within an individual social channel, there's so many different ways to operate now, right? You can do posts, you can do videos, you can do stories, you can comment on other people's things. You can, you know, there's a lot of room to move there if you if you want to. So you got to figure out what kind of syncopation and rhythm you actually personally enjoy. Because just like anything else, if you don't derive some measure of satisfaction and pleasure out of it, you're going to find a way to not do it, right? You're going you're gonna to invent a bunch of excuses that sound super rational of why you shouldn't do this, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and this is going to sound a little, I don't know, may, maybe a little Machiavellian, but it, it really does matter. You've got to batch your relationships, okay? So the same way that you might have uh, class A, class B, class C, and class D prospects that your company's trying to land, you got to do the same thing with relationships, right? And and we all do this to some level unconsciously, right? You've got your best friends, you've got your sort of second generation of friends, you got your third cycle of friends, and you got kind of weird rando Facebook friends, um, you know, and beyond. And, and, and in this business relationship building context, you got to do the same thing and, and, and literally write it down. So the best way to do it is to take like a spreadsheet uh, and 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 have four tabs on the bottom. And the first tab is tier one relationships. Second tab, tier two relationships. Third tab, tier three relationships. Tier four relationships. Name the actual people. That forces you to consistently kind of reassess and move people from tier to tier as the relationship progresses or wanes. And then what you do, Mo, is you figure out what your idealized cadence is for each tier. So as you might suspect, just like it is with your regular contacts and friends and relationships and your mom or whatever, um, like I talk to my my kids the most, my mom second most, right? My close friends third most, same thing, right? So you say, all right, what we want to try and do is for those tier one relationships, I want to try to um, at least be on their radar, add value, say hi, just check in um, every 15 days. Boom. For the tier two people, it's every 30 days, right? For the tier three people, it's every 60 days. For the tier four people, it's every 90 days. Those aren't the magic numbers, but somewhere in that ballpark is probably about appropriate. And then you just put it on your calendar. But you have to schedule relationship time. The same way that you schedule gym time. The same way that you schedule eating time. Right. If, if you're like, hey, I'm going to go to the gym when I have literally nothing better to do, I got some news for you. You're not going to go to the gym very much. And the same thing happens with this. If you're like, OK, if I got all my work done <laughs> and there's nothing in my inbox and I got nothing on my to do list, then and only then will I put some time into investing in relationships. That's not going to happen. It'll happen like twice. And you're like, I just don't have time anymore. And look, when people say they don't have time, I can't tell you how much that annoys me. Keep going. Keep going. It's not true. It's not true. Everybody has time. You always have time. It's how are you prioritizing that time? What you're saying, when you tell yourself you don't have time, what you're actually saying, but you refuse to admit to yourself is, I don't think this is important enough to devote my time to it. Yet, and I'm not a big part of that kind of hustle culture. I think that's way overblown and and also axiomatic. Like, oh, here's the hustle. Here's the big hustle st- statement. Hey, if you want to be good at business, you should work hard. Thanks. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, but the reality is, I saw this stat last week. Mo freaked me out. The average Netflix subscriber watches 21 hours of Netflix a week. If you made it 19 hours of Netflix a week and spent two hours interacting with your tier one and tier two contacts on LinkedIn, trust me when I tell you those two hours will be very well spent. So it's not about you don't have time. It's about you've decided that other things are more important. And that's either because A, you don't really like it, which goes back to the first point we talked about, right? You're not executing in a way that you find pleasure. Or B, you don't actually believe it will work, right? There is no C. It's either you don't like it or you don't believe in it, right? There is no C. So, so you have to decide, 
if you're not valuing it enough to put on your calendar, and most people don't, that's the big mistake. They don't put it on their calendar. If you're not valuing relationship building enough to put it on your calendar, you've got to ask yourself why. Is it you don't like it or you don't believe in it? And once you kind of get clear in your own head as to what that obstacle is, then you can start knocking it down. Jay, I, I absolutely love this. And you saw me grinning from ear to ear for a big chunk of that because it's, you know, our book, The Snowball System, all of chapter four talks about uh, how, to, how to dial up likability. We've got a concept called the protomoy list. Protomoy is a Greek word. It means first among equals. And it's about defining your most important, your first among equals relationships. Yep. So I love the content. And it's so cool having a, another expert come in and share that with our audience. So here's the thing. Um, so let's say somebody's, they're bought it. They heard your speech. They're like, okay, I'm finally, I'm finally going to do this. I'm going to get serious. I'm going to block time off my calendar. I totally mm -hmm. 100% aligned with everything you said. The next thing that people hesitate around is, well, I, I don't have anything to say. Uh, you know, I don't want to be a nag. I hear it all the time. Jay, mm -hmm. give us your best advice. Give us your top five ways mm -hmm. that you yeah. do this, that you reach out to be helpful, that you reach out to be top of mind. What should people do when they reach out? I typically don't. The, the best way to stay top of mind is not to provide value. The best way to stay top of mind is to just raise your hand. Mm. It's study what your relationships are doing and then comment or amplify or add value to what they're doing, right? So if you're like, I don't have anything to say, okay, well, if somebody on your tier one list puts something on LinkedIn that you think is valuable, just amplify and share it or comment on it, right? Something that they can see, right? Don't just hit the, the, the like button because they can't really see that, right? You've got to actually add a comment and say, wow, Mo, that was a genius post. I really loved it. Hope you're doing great. That's it. It's one sentence, right? You don't have to like write an essay every time. You want to do that eventually, right? You want to add value, but, but people tend to underestimate um, the value of amplification and ratification for other people, right? So here's the funny thing about it. <laughs> you're like, well, I, I don't feel like I have anything to say. Yet your tier one relationship person managed to figure it out. They just put something on LinkedIn. So all you got to do, they're probably uneasy about it the same way you're uneasy about it. So if you can share that for them, draw attention to them and their work, that's where people really care, right? They, they, they don't, you don't have to be the smart one every time. You can just be the cheerleader. Jay, I love it. I absolutely love it. And what that does is just brings the barrier down so low. Anybody can do that. If they, if they don't think they can do that, they just need to try. It's not that hard. And then now you're engaged, right? Now you're, I liked your idea of raising the hand. Now you're in a conversation. They will notice, trust me. Can I, how much time we got? We got it. Let me tell yeah, you a story. It. When I started uh, this company, Convince and Convert, 13 years ago, um, I started a blog um, and it was just me in my bedroom. And I literally had zero blog readers. And then I got my mom. So then I had one. And quite literally, nobody in the entire world had heard of me other than people in Arizona where I used to live. Pretty small audience. What I would do every morning, Mo, is because I had sort of the West Coast time penalty. I'd get up um, and about 5.30 in the morning, I'd get online. And this has been back when blogging was really the thing. And I would read, scan 30 to 40 blogs written by people who were known in the digital marketing space. And every time it was a blog post that I thought was interesting, which was most of the time, I would then leave a detailed comment about what I thought about the post. And then I would share their work uh, on, on Twitter, which was sort of the way to do it back then. And I did that every day for three hours a day for six months. And then after six months, one of those people, Jason Falls is his name, um, actually went on Twitter and said, I peep getting comments on my blog from this guy, Jay Bear. I've never heard of him before, but he's really smart. And that drew some people to me and then to my blog. And within another nine months, uh, I had the number three marketing blog in the world. But all I did to get started was schedule time 
to tell other people how great they were. I love it. And you stuck with it. Even when you weren't getting results that's, I mean, the first that's couple it. months, I would guess, you stuck with the plan. I stuck with it for six months before I saw any evidence of success whatsoever. I love it. I literally put, let's see, it's three hours a day. Um, so 60 hours. Um, I put 360 hours of work into it before I got any results at all. I love it. Jay, that's a perfect story to wrap up these episodes. Folks, If I, I know you love that. If you didn't catch the prior three episodes, you need to, because the wisdom that Jay dropped on us was amazing. The next episode, I'm going to recap the top three things that I learned from Jay that are going to be applicable exactly to you, to the to our audience. So you're going to want to see that too. Jay, where should people go to get more insights around the topics that we talked about today? Uh, two places, convinceandconvert.com is our primary website. Literally thousands of articles, resources, free downloads, podcast episodes uh, for folks just like you. And then my main site for myself, uh, for, for speaking and thought leadership, et cetera, is jbear.com. I love it. And they're both so well done. You can tell you're a marketer because they're fantastic. Thanks. Folks, the, the resources on both of those websites are absolutely fantastic. I use them. You should too. Jay, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Mo. Appreciate it. A lot of fun. Cool. Hi, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm author of The Snowball System, and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 high-end professionals all over the world on sound, efficient, and authentic business development techniques. In this episode, I'm really excited because I'm going to recap one specific skill that Jay Bear brought up in, the, in our last four episodes. So this is a recap episode of the Jay Bear episodes, but with a twist. We usually have the top three things that I learned from that person. And I actually taped that episode yesterday. And I woke up this morning and I realized I can do better. There's more value I can provide you. So I deleted it. <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was really, it was good stuff. It was the top three things I learned from Jay, really good stuff. But I realized if we take one thing, one thing from Jay and really blow it out. And if I can help you with one specific skill that falls right out of the last four episodes, then I think that would be a ton more valuable. And it's the idea of marketing your marketing. Now, those of you who know me know I love threes. Tons of research behind why threes are more memorable. Three Things in threes are more memorable. Things in threes are more believable. So don't, you won't be disappointed. I'll still give you this in three steps. Three, three, uh, it'll be a three-act play, if you will. Three steps to the process. Um, but I think, I think really focusing on that skill is going to give us a lot more value than if I had three sort of disparate ideas. So why is this important? It's really important because what most, what most experts do, say you're a, a specialist or an expert at a big healthcare company and you're gonna do a webinar or you're a lawyer, a consultant, accountant, architect, engineer, some kind of professional that, that's gonna give a webinar, just as an example. Well, it's gonna take you 20 or 30 hours or something like that to create the content and deliver the webinar. Um, maybe less if it's a webinar on a content you already know really well. Maybe more if the webinar, air quotes, is actually a speech and you have to travel to somewhere. But my point with this is it's some kind of content and, and, and you're going to develop that content, whether it's a webinar, a speech, an article, a blog post, a client alert, or whatever. And it takes a certain amount of time. So let's just say 20 hours, just, just to pick a number. Uh, many of those things are more, many things are less, let's say 20. Well, what most experts have time to do is a few of those a year. So let's say you could do three of those a year. That'd be pretty, pretty awesome. 60 hours all in on lead gen efforts. Well, I would much rather, let's say you can do four of these for even math. So let's say it's going to take 80 hours a year to do four of these webinars or whatever for your lead gen experts. Well, I would far rather have you do two instead of four and take the remaining time. So instead of 80 hours to do four webinars or whatever your content is, I would much rather see you do two webinars and spend the exact same amount of time. Now you get free up 80 hours or 40 hours of your 80. I'd rather have you spend that time on marketing your marketing. 
you are going to get, and I don't think this is an exaggeration, I don't have science behind this, but you're going to get 10x the result. I really firmly believe that from training tens of 10,000 plus people. You're going to get 10x the result from slowing down, picking the two most meaty or um, the most magnetic pieces of content, and, and doubling down in your efforts to market them, then you are scattershot doing twice as many events, twice as many pieces of content, and not doing an effective job of marketing. That is why this is important. You can spend the same amount of time and get 10x the result. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. That's what I'm gonna show you how to do in this episode. Now, before we get into it, know that if you want our best thinking on all things business development, just head over to growbigplaybook.com and you can sign up in about 10 seconds to get our weekly newsletter. I write it myself. I spend a couple hours a week writing that meaty content. I send it out to all of our audience and you're gonna be able to read in about five minutes uh, our weekly little newsletter called Grow Big Playbook. That's why it's at growbigplaybook.com. And, and you're gonna be able to get some, you're gonna be able to elevate some specific skill that's gonna help you either grow your book of business, deepen relationships, or grow your career every single time. 10 seconds to sign up, five minutes a week, incredibly valuable, growbigplaybook.com. All right, so with that out of the way, here is your three act play. Here are the three things you need to know to market your marketing. Thing one is planning. Thing two is the lead up before the launch. And thing three, three is what you do after launch. Here is how you do step one. Step one, develop a plan. So if you've got some meaty piece of content, it could be a live event, a speech, a webinar, whatever. It could be something that lasts forever, like a book, an article, a client alert, a blog post. Whatever the thing is, you want to spend a hefty amount of time up front before you even get started. That's why this is step one. Before you even create the content, you want to develop the, the outline of the content, you want to be very specific on who the audience is, and you want to develop the ways that you can market your marketing, market the content before the event and after the event, before the launch and after the launch. Those are steps two and three. Well, how do you do this? First, I want you to get a group of people together. This is the kind of thing where you just, I just have never seen a single person be able to do this as well as two or three or four people together in a room on a Zoom call thinking it through. A, you, you wanna start with what the content is. What does your, your audience need to know? Uh, what are those new regs that are coming? What's that meaty piece of content that they would, they would die to know? Figuring out what that is and figuring out something that people would die to have is incredible. Jay's example was really good. He did an analysis, an analysis and assessment of the top 50 universities' websites. Well, who are some of his big clients? Universities. What do they want to know? How they stack up against each other. Who had done that analysis before? Nobody. So when Jay did this, created an algorithm, created an analysis of the top 50 uh, websites and how effective they were at various universities, well, that gave him information. People want, what, what's, what can be really magnetic in the world is when you know something that no one else knows. So if you're the one that curates the list, has the algorithm, has the data, um, it's incredibly powerful and people want that. It invokes the idea of scarcity, uh, uh, incredibly scientifically proven psychological principle that we want more of what there is less of. So if you're the one that's got the data, if you're the only person who knows something about the issue, um, it may be that everybody knows what the new regs might look like, but few people maybe have done a survey of what how people are, are planning to handle the regs. Well, that survey data, you could own and own alone. So in the planning part, what you're doing is is three big things. You're trying to figure out the content that no one else has or something that's as, as unique as possible, A. B is you're trying to figure out exactly who your audience is. I would get down to actually people's names. Who are the desirable people, the personas? Uh, not as much personas, but actually people's names. Jane Smith, who is general counsel at this big life sciences com com uh, company. John Doe, who is CEO of, the, of a re uh, top uh, uh, Fortune 50 retailer in the US. Um, whoever your audience is, if you can get it down to actual names, that precision, that specificity, that will help you then create the content in a way because you've got them in mind. That's gonna serve us better later too, 
but more on that. And then lastly, how are we going to design a marketing plan before and after launch to be effective? How are we going to let people know about this? That leads us right into step two. So develop a plan. Spend the time. That couple of hours up front, you'll be amazed at how much more effective and what the pull through is on the back end if you do step one up front. Now let's move to step two, pre-launch. You've got a plan, you develop, you develop the content, um, you, you, you know who you want to get that in front of. So your goal in pre-launch is to, and I love Jay's word here, atomize your content. So every slide can become an infographic. Every um, quip that, uh, that is sort of a section header of your talk can become a, a, a 30 second video that, that's put on social media. Try to take everything you've got and get it down into little bite-sized pieces that you can promote digitally and in other places. And you can have your partners, colleagues, and strategic partners send these out to people. Your goal in pre-launch, whether it's a live event or if it's a, a thing that lasts forever, like a, a blog post or a book, is to get as many people excited about it at launch. If it's a live event, very specifically, you're trying to get as many people to attend the live event as possible. If it's a webinar, great. If it's a speech, you want to get people at the conference and attending your session. That takes work. And that's why you want to galvanize a large group of people, your partners at your organization, the account management or client executive function at your organization, um, strategic partners, folks who call on the same people you do, but, but they have a different discipline. You want to galvanize that whole group of people that are your friends and your allies to get the word out. Get as many people in the session if it's a live event, and if it's a, a, a static thing like a book, the snowball system, the, war, the first week is incredibly powerful. So you're getting to as many people to read the client alert, to, um, to read the blog post, to read the book, whatever, in week one. That's what launch is about. It's, about. it's about galvanizing the forces you have at your disposal to get a massive amount of momentum. Okay, that's step, step two. Step three. This is the most important one. And the quip that we use here, the headline, is that after you, you, you publish the thing, the client alert goes out for the first time, you do the webinar, whatever, most people view that, most professionals view that as the finish line. I want you to view that, even though we're at step beginning of step three here, I want you to view that as the starting line. Why would I say that? Well, nobody ever hires you because you great, gave a great webinar. That's really neat. You helped people, but in their mind, it's done. The person provides the webinar, they do this to get their name out there, and that's sort of the end of it. But that's not the end of it for you, right? If, if some organic uh, call happens because somebody met you in the webinar and they call you, great. But you don't want to just leave your future, your future to that. That should be 120th of the value you get. That should be, that should be just icing on the cake. What you do in step three is you organize an effort and you want to pull this into your planning so you have it planned out in step one up front. This is just the execution part. But you organize an effort where your colleagues, your partners, the account management, client executive function, your third party friends, your, your strategic partners, where they go around and you set this all up ahead of time so that they get a win too. They go around and they suggest that people they know, by the way that were on your list you created in step one, people that they know can meet you and talk about how the content impacts them. So say your webinar was about the new regulations coming and you did a survey that no one else had, you just gave it, you've got that half-life where you got a week or two where you're really, you're, you're, you, you've got the most amount of oomph in the marketplace shortly after you, you give the live event, shortly after the client alerts is published, shortly after the book launches. There's a half-life where over time, your, 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 um, your gravitas, your presence, your preeminence wanes on this one thing. And it depends on what it is, but, but you want to seize the momentum you've got in the marketplace right after your launch, right after the live event, right after the thing is published. Because if, you're, if your friends out there, your allies I talked about before, if they go to Jane Smith, who's the GC at the big life sciences company, if they go to John Doe, the CEO of the company you'd like to work with, and somebody Jane or John knows says, hey, I know Bill who just gave that webinar. Here it is, by the way. Here's a link to it. I talked to him. 
he said he he's super busy right now. Only say that if it's true, but I assume you are. He's busy right now, but he would love or he would be willing or be pleased to be actually meet with you one on one. And whether you attended the webinar or not, talk about specifically how it applies to your organization, because there's a lot of nuance with you, especially because you have so much mid Atlantic trade or whatever or, or, or across Atlantic trade. And it's in that meeting that you're actually going to get hired. That's the meeting where they get to meet you. They get to really develop a relationship with you. With you. you get to dig into the issues at the organization. That's when they realize they need you either, people get hired for two ways, either because you've got expertise they don't have or you've got bandwidth they don't have and they realize in that meeting they need you. That is when the magic's going to happen. That is when you're going to get hired. That's when you're actually going to get a payoff for all this work you did to create the content and deliver whatever your product was, the live event or publish the, the, the piece. So if you think of this in this three-step process, this sort of this three-act play, what most people do is they only do part of it and only for a sliver of it. They create the content, they do the thing, and they end. I want you to broaden your scope to get really specific about how you not only create the market, but marketing, but you market the marketing. And I want you to think of it in these three acts. The planning part, which plays it all the way through. So you can start to incorporate all these conversations in your normal day-to-day -day uh, interactions. That's when it gets really easy. If you, if you plan it up front, that go slow to go fast, you'll be amazed at how you're just sort of parked downhill for the rest of the, of the whole, of the whole uh, process. And then step two, trying to get as many eyeballs excited into the actual event or excited about the launch, depending on the, on the type of content it is. So you get traction right out of the gate. That's important. And then step three, that's where the rubber is going to hit the road. That's where you're going to win. That's where you're going to actually orchestrate a campaign to get your content in front of people while it's at its peak value, while it's got its peak desirability, and you're trying to get as many one-on-one -on -one conversations with you and your team and, and your client and prospect organizations and their team. You're trying to get as many of those as you can in step three because that is where the gold is. That is where the magic's gonna happen. So I hope you enjoyed this. I still gave you the rule of three, but we did, uh, we did go deep into one process step, but this is one of all the things we see in the, our comprehensive book, The Snowball System, our, our comprehensive training in Grow Big, this idea of properly orchestrating a campaign around a piece of content is probably, it's at least in the top five things that people get wrong. A, they don't do it enough because maybe they don't think it works or it takes too much time or whatever. But B, they, because they're not doing it in the right way, they don't see the fruits of it and they think it can't work. But let me tell you, if you do these things in this order, Lots more detail in the snowball system on this, by the way. But if you publish your meaty pieces, your desirable, your magnetic pieces of content in the way I just described today, you will be blown away at the effectiveness because you're helping people before they even know they have a need sometimes. They're getting a chance to see how great you are, what's in your big brain, but how pleasurable, how, does, how enjoyable it is to work with you. And you're doing that pro actively. I hope this video was helpful to you. I enjoyed taping it. I'm glad I went down this road instead of the others because this is the other one because this is way better than what I did yesterday. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Share this with others because this video can get your entire team working from the same playbook around doing all this stuff the right way. I'll see you next time.